All right, diving in this time with a book that throws out some, well, interesting ideas. Oh, yeah, this one's a doozy. It's called Psychiatry Key Secret ESP Control. A mouthful, I know. But the title kind of gives you a hint of what we're getting into. Definitely. The basic premise is you can tap into, like, hidden psychic powers. ESP plus control, that's what they call it. Right. And it's supposed to give you control over all these aspects of your life. From strength to influencing others, even, like, messing with the elements. Yeah, it sounds pretty out there, right? Like, straight out of a comic book. But that's what we're here for, to break it down. If there's anything to these claims. Exactly. And, and you know, it actually connects to some familiar ideas, in a way. Oh, absolutely. Like, the law of assumption. Right, that whole believe it and it will come true kind of thing. And then there's Neville Goddard talking about imagination shaping reality. So maybe not superpowers exactly, but... But maybe some principles we can actually use. Right. So Psychostra lays out all these uh, pretty incredible feats. Oh, yeah. They don't hold back. Like taking down a lion with one move. Passing exams without even cracking a book. Even becoming invisible. They're really going for it. It's definitely attention grabbing. That's for sure. So what we want to do is, you know, unpack these examples a bit. See if there's a core idea we can learn from. Exactly. So... One thing that keeps popping up is this mind navel thing. That's their big secret, supposedly. The key to accessing these powers. So what is it exactly? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Well, the way they describe it, it's like this gateway in your mind. Okay, I can picture that. It connects your physical body to this uh, energy source. They call it psychostra, right. Right, this hidden energy that we all supposedly have. Hmm. Sounds a bit like the subconscious in a way. Yeah, there are definitely some parallels. That part of us that's always working beneath the surface. Influencing our thoughts, our actions. So are they saying we can control reality through our subconscious? That seems to be the idea. Through this mind-navel connection. Right, and it ties back to the law of assumption, too. If you change your beliefs, you change this energy, and you change your reality. It's like... Changing the channel on your mental TV. Interesting analogy. Tuning into a different frequency. Okay, I'm starting to see how these pieces fit together. It's all about tapping into this hidden power. But how do we actually do that? Well, that's where the book gets really wild. Yeah, they have all these crazy stories, right? Like George Aspinwall using visualization to win a court case. Oh, right. That one was pretty intense. He was facing some serious trouble. Could have lost his whole business. But instead of stressing out, he just visualized himself winning. And it actually worked. That's what the book says. So basically, he willed himself to victory. By believing in a positive outcome. It reminds me of what Neville Gaddard said about living in the end state. Oh, definitely. Focusing on the feeling of already having what you want. So even if we're skeptical of psychic powers, there's a lesson there. For sure. The power of mindset, visualization. Right. Our thoughts can have a real impact. Absolutely. Then there's that whole body power section. Oh, yeah, where they claim you can get superhuman strength. By tapping into this astral body flow. They talk about deep breathing, visualization, intense focus. Sounds like a workout for your mind. It does, doesn't it? But, you know, there are real practices that use similar techniques. Like meditation, yeah. mindfulness. Exactly. Focusing your attention, quieting your thoughts. But are they saying those can give us superpowers? Well, maybe not in the literal sense. But maybe they help us unlock some hidden potential. That's what they're suggesting, yeah. Like athletes using visualization mm -hmm. to improve their performance. Exactly. Training their minds to achieve peak results. So it's about aligning your thoughts and actions toward a goal. And pushing your limits beyond what you thought possible. Okay, then there's that story about Richard Foley. The guy with the photographic memory. Yeah, apparently he could photograph information just by skimming it. Sounds pretty unbelievable, Iris. Is that even possible? Well, the book connects it to techniques like speed reading. Oh, right, where you train your eyes to take in information faster. And memory palaces, where you use visual associations to remember things. So maybe not literally taking a picture with your mind. But still some pretty impressive memory skills. Right. They call it creative memory in the book. As opposed to just retentive memory, which is just memorizing facts. So it's about applying knowledge in new and innovative ways. Exactly. Not just storing information, but using it creatively. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. It's about understanding and utilizing information effectively. But this next part is where things get a little uh, tricky. Oh yeah, this one raises some eyebrows. They talk about power over man or beast. Influencing others through psychic means. Yeah, like some kind of mind control. 
That's what they're suggesting. They have this example of a woman, Mrs. Dantrill, who uses visualization. To get her neighbors to give her food. Yeah, it's presented as a success story. But it definitely brings up ethical concerns. For sure. Mm. Manipulating people isn't exactly a good thing. The book tries to explain it in terms of suggestion, subconscious influence. Like she projected her desires so strongly that it affected others. That's the idea, but it's still pretty ethically questionable. Definitely something to think about carefully. All right, let's move on to another one of these emergency stories. Oh yeah, these are always wild. This one's about an elderly man named Rampasha. And he runs 100 miles overnight. That's what the book claims. By visualizing his superhuman astral body. Right, tapping into this hidden energy. Okay, that one stretches the limits of believability a bit. It does. But there might be a lesson there, even if we're skeptical. About the power of belief, maybe? Exactly. And the mind-body connection. Like how people can accomplish incredible things under extreme stress. Adrenaline kicks in, they tap into reserves they didn't know they had. Right, like they're pushing past their perceived limits. And don't forget the placebo effect. Oh, right, the power of belief to create actual physical changes. So maybe Rampasha wasn't literally running on astral energy. But his belief might have unlocked some hidden potential. Interesting. It all comes back to the power of the mind. Absolutely. And speaking of mind-blowing concepts... You're talking about the psychosmic ray. The big one. Yeah, what exactly is that supposed to be? Well, they describe it as this powerful energy source. It's coming from the center of the galaxy. Right, like some kind of cosmic force. Okay, I'm going to need a bit more explanation on that one. We'll unpack it all after a quick break. Sounds good. We'll be right back to dive into the psychosmic ray. And all the wild possibilities it supposedly holds. All right, so where were we? Ah, yes, the psychosmic ray. A big, mysterious energy source from space. Right. But before we dive into that, there are a few more stories from the book I think we should touch on. Oh, good point. Yeah. They really pack a lot in. They do. There's one about Donna Wilson, who transforms herself, almost like a Cinderella story. Oh, yeah, Donna. She wasn't like traditionally attractive. Right, and couldn't find a partner despite, you know, trying all the usual things. And then she meets this military officer. And instead of focusing on what she saw as her flaws... She uses visualization. Exactly. She visualizes herself as his ideal woman, embodies the qualities she thinks he wants. So she basically fakes it till she makes it, using the power of her mind. In a way, yes. And according to the book, it works. The officer sees her as she wants to be seen, and they end up getting married. Wow, that's pretty powerful, if true. It really ties into the law of assumption, right? Assuming the feeling of being the person you want to be. And then supposedly influencing your external circumstances to match. This psychostra stuff is real making me think. It's definitely thought-provoking, but remember, always approach these ideas with a healthy dose of critical thinking, too. Right, of course. So let's shift gears a bit and talk more about memory power. Okay, yeah, we touched on that briefly with Richard Foley. The photographic memory guy. But the book actually connects memory to the nervous system. Wait, our nerves play a role in memory. I thought that was all about the brain. Well, the book highlights the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Oh, right. Those are part of the aut autonomic nervous system. Exactly. The one that controls all the automatic functions, like breathing and heart rate. Okay. But how does that connect to memory? So they suggest that the sympathetic nervous system, which kicks in when you're alert, Focus. Like fight or flight mode. Yeah, that's linked to long-term memory. So when you're studying for a big exam and your heart's racing? That's your sympathetic nervous system helping you remember the material. Interesting. And the parasympathetic. That's the one that's active when you're relaxed, and they connect that to short-term memory. So remembering what I had for breakfast this morning would be my parasympathetic system. Exactly. The book proposes that by consciously activating either system, you can actually improve your memory. So, need to remember something for the long haul. Mm. Focus intently. Right. Activate that sympathetic nervous system. Short-term recall. Maybe a more relaxed state is better. It's like choosing the right gear for your memory, depending on the task. I like that analogy. So then they get back into retentive memory, which is just memorizing facts, versus creative memory, which is about applying knowledge in new ways. Right. We talked about that earlier, creative memory being more about problem solving and innovation. Exactly. And they argue that creative memory is much more valuable than just knowing a lot of facts. Well, yeah, we have Google for facts these days. Right. What we need are the skills to actually use that information effectively. Okay. So how do we develop this creative memory according to Psychostra? They offer several techniques and exercises, 
But one key principle is to engage with information actively rather than just passively absorbing it. So asking yourself questions, making connections, trying to apply what you're learning to real world situations. Exactly. It's not just about remembering. It's about understanding and utilizing information. That makes sense. And then they share some pretty interesting stories about people who seemingly achieve extraordinary memory feats. Oh, right, like those case studies. Exactly. There's Ken Atkins, who was never academically inclined, but then he writes this love letter to his crush. Ah, the power of love. Right. But this letter is filled with, like, eloquent language, deep insights, totally unlike his usual self. So he tapped into some hidden potential. That's what the book suggests, that he unconsciously accessed knowledge he didn't even know he had. Wow, that's pretty wild. It is. And it suggests that maybe we all have these hidden mental reserves just waiting to be unlocked. I like that idea. Then there's Radford Murphy, the struggling writer who becomes a millionaire by 40. By harnessing his memory. Right. He had trouble getting his writing published, but then he shifts his focus, starts devouring information about business and finance. So he used his memory to spot opportunities, make smart investments. Exactly. He was able to absorb and synthesize information quickly and apply it to the world of business. It's amazing how a shift in mindset and a focus on learning can lead to such dramatic results. These stories really highlight the power of the human mind. And the potential that we all have within us. Perhaps we can all achieve remarkable things if we tap into the right mental resources. Okay, so back to that mind-blowing concept, the psychosmic ray. The big one. You mentioned it's connected to these tiny particles called neutrinos. How does that work exactly? Well, the book gets pretty technical here, but it basically suggests that everything in the universe is made up of atoms. Right. Basic building blocks of matter. And those atoms are constantly vibrating, emitting energy. So we're all just bundles of vibrating energy. In a way, yes. Now imagine this psychosmic ray as a powerful form of energy emanating from the center of our galaxy. The center of the galaxy? That's incredibly far away. How does that energy even reach us? This is where they bring in neutrinos. They're everywhere, constantly bombarding us from space. Right, those tiny, almost massless particles. Exactly. And the book claims they're somehow connected to this psychosmic ray. So it's not like a beam of energy shooting at us from the Milky Way. No, it's more like we're swimming in the sea of cosmic energy, and the psychosmic ray is a specific type of wave within that sea. Okay, that's a helpful image. And the book claims that ancient Egyptian magicians or psychic masters were able to harness the psychosmic ray to perform incredible feats. Like parting the Red Sea, turning staffs into snakes. Well, the book doesn't go that far, but they describe manipulating the elements, influencing minds, even teleporting themselves. Whoa, teleporting. That's where I have to draw the line. Sounds a bit far-fetched. Remember, we're approaching this with a healthy dose of skepticism, but the book does offer techniques for supposedly absorbing this psychosmic ray. Okay, like what? Intense visualization, mental focus, that kind of thing. So, like meditating in a special way, focusing on the center of the galaxy? Something like that, but whether it actually works, that's another question. Yeah, I'm not sure I have that level of cosmic concentration. But even if we take the idea metaphorically, it's interesting to consider, what if we could tap into some universal source of energy to enhance our abilities? Okay, I can get behind that idea. Like, we all have this potential for greatness within us. And by aligning ourselves with this cosmic energy, we can unlock it. I like that. Now, the book presents several more case studies of individuals supposedly harnessing psychostra. Oh, right. More of those amazing stories. One that stands out is Zumbalaki, an Egyptian psychic master who used the psychosmic ray to escape from a collapsed temple with his followers. Wait, so he, like, blasted his way out with cosmic energy? Well, the book describes him performing a ritual involving ram's horns and concentrated visualization. Okay, this is getting pretty out there. He supposedly focuses the psychosmic ray energy at the walls of the temple, causing them to crumble and create an escape route. So he's like a cosmic superhero channeling the power of the galaxy. It's a pretty vivid image. Then there's the story of Upklintu, an Indian psychic master who seemingly manipulated the growth of plants and even performed illusions. Oh, like making things disappear and reappear. Classic stage magic stuff. Indeed. The book describes him using psychostra to accelerate the growth of mango trees, making them sprout from seeds and bear fruit instantly. Okay, that's where my skepticism kicks in again. Instant mango trees. It does sound a bit far-fetched. He also supposedly creates illusions of levitation and vanishing objects, all through the power of his mind. 
Right. Our minds can play tricks on us, that's for sure. It does make you question the nature of reality. What we perceive as real might be influenced by our thoughts and beliefs more than we realize. That's a trippy thought. Speaking of the power of belief, there's a fascinating story about a young Marine named Ted Stewart who fought in World War II and miraculously emerged without a scratch. Wait, unscathed through all that. The book attributes his survival to his unwavering belief in his own safety. He supposedly visualized himself returning home unharmed. And despite facing incredible danger. Exactly. His intuition and reflexes seem to guide him through every perilous situation. So like a sixth sense, a heightened awareness that kept him out of harm's way. Precisely. It ties back to the power of belief and the idea that our thoughts can influence our reality. Even in the midst of chaos and danger, a strong conviction can potentially create a protective shield. That's pretty powerful stuff. So after diving deep into Psychastra, what are your thoughts? It's a wild ride, that's for sure. It is. Lots of incredible claims, some more believable than others. Definitely. But even with a healthy dose of skepticism, this book really makes you think. It does. Maybe there's more to our minds, to this universe, than we currently understand. That's a possibility we can't rule out. But the question is, how do we separate the fantastical from the practical? Right. Can we actually learn to harness this psychastro power? Or is it just a collection of, well, entertaining stories? That's the big question, right? Mm -hmm. Can we actually unlock these powers, or is it all just a good story? Well, the book does lay out techniques exercises, you know, things you can supposedly do to harness this psychosmic ray energy. Right, right. But it takes a lot of uh, dedication, belief, that kind of thing. Yeah, not everyone's going to be meditating on neutrinos to get what they want. Exactly. But even if we're not ready to be, you know, psychic masters or whatever, right. are there any takeaways here that we can actually use? Oh, absolutely. I mean, remember, the book connects a lot of these ideas to principles we've talked about before. Right. The law of assumption visualization, positive self-talk, focusing your intention. Those are all pretty common in self-development stuff. Exactly. It's all about harnessing the power of your mind. So maybe we don't need to become psychic to achieve extraordinary things. Maybe not. Maybe it's just about tapping into the power we already have. Believing in ourselves, our ability to create the life we want. I like that. So even with the fantastical elements, Psychostra really points us back to that. To the incredible potential within each of us. Exactly. Well, this has been a wild ride, that's for sure. It has. A fascinating book. Even if we take some of it with a grain of salt. Yeah, definitely a lot to think about. For sure. And hey, if anyone listening wants to explore Psychostra for themselves... See what resonates with them. Be sure to comment, key why, and sign up for our newsletter. You'll get a free copy of the book which normally sells for $950. It's a great opportunity to dive in and see what you think. And if you're ready to take a deeper dive, explore how to apply these principles to your own life. Yeah. We offer one-on-one -on -one consultations. We can help you unlock your potential, manifest your desires. Whether you believe in cosmic rays or not. Exactly. We'll find practical ways to use these concepts to achieve your goals. So, until next time. Keep those minds open. And happy deep diving.